Talk to us about how well positioned uh, the vice president is to make this switch as, you know, you can't hold campaign rallies, um, you can't meet with people in public, you can't shake hands, which is something that Joe Biden has always been pretty good at. Yeah, uh, well, thanks for having me. I, I think it's a weird time in politics, just like it's a weird time in business and everywhere else. I think um, there's a lot of challenges associated with having to sort of throw out every plan that they had, presumably, for the next month, two months, three months, whatever it's going to be, and figure out how to do everything remotely. I also think there's a big opportunity there. I mean, the entire country is stuck at home spending even more time with our devices than we usually did, which was already quite a lot of time. And that's a lot of um, attention that a campaign that does it right can um, can grab. And I don't think that's going to be easy. I mean, we're all focused on one thing right now. And by the way, a whole lot of people probably aren't that inclined to donate to a campaign or do some of the other things that a campaign needs. But we are kind of tethered to our phones more than usual. And I think that creates an opportunity to do some cool stuff and, and reap the benefits. That said, Biden's campaign rushed to put together a TV studio in his home. He uh, gave a, a live update uh, on how he believes this coronavirus epidemic should be handled, and yet none of the major uh, networks took that broadcast. You had, like, tens of thousands of, of, of people tuning in. Meantime, you have President Trump on television every day um, and in front of America's faces. So is, is Biden at a disadvantage here, um, given how expertly the president himself has managed to use technology despite never sending an email? <laughs> well, I think what you're talking about is more of a condemnation of the mainstream media than it is a compliment to Trump or, uh, or a diss on the Biden campaign, in my opinion. Um, we all know that the president is um, uh, peddling disinformation at these uh, once or sometimes twice daily two hour long um, press conferences every day. And I think the cable networks ought to stop covering them. Um, and I do think there ought to be at, at minimum um, parity, um, you know, in the in terms of their live coverage of Trump uh, and their live coverage of, um, of the Democratic Party. Uh, and it's increasingly likely who our um, nominee is gonna be. I do think in point of fact, there's a disadvantage there. I mean, you know, you are exactly right. We've got uh, a whole bunch of networks covering Trump live a couple hours a day. And, um, you know, the former vice president's having to sort of build an audience from scratch on his digital platforms every day. So uh, talk to us then, uh, you know, Biden isn't isn't the nominee yet. You've still got Bernie Sanders out there who, you know, seems to be doing a pretty good job um, tapping into this online moment. He's got, you know, upwards of 5 million people um, dialing into his, his online rallies. Is Senator Sanders better equipped here than the vice president to take advantage of this? Well, S Senator Sanders is, uh, I think, you know, probably the best digital candidate uh, I've seen in my lifetime, and I'm a Obama person, so it's a little hard for me to say, but I think that's true. Um, so obviously, he has um, uh, some kind of an advantage, and if you've got millions and millions more followers than your competitor, um, that means there's millions more people who are likely to get a notification or see it on their feed when they log into Facebook or whatever it is that you're live. Um, and that just means more people are going to um, tune in. So, you know, obviously, you know, the um, Vice President Biden has a disadvantage in that he was in office, um, you know, in the Vice President's office for eight of the kind of formative um, years in which a lot of other politicians were building up their followings. And that means he's got, um, you know, he's got less of an audience to bank on. Let's talk a little bit about Facebook, since you mentioned that, you know, leading up to uh, this, this, you know, you had candidates like Mike Bloomberg, Tom Steyer, spending big time on Facebook ads. But, you know, those candidates, Mike Bloomberg, of course, the founder of, of Bloomberg LP, the parent company of this network, um, they didn't seem to make a dent when it came to votes in the primary. Does that have something to say about Facebook and the value of Facebook ads? I guess for me that um, that says a little bit less about the value of Facebook ads than it does about the value of ads in this current political moment in America. You know, I don't think that you can point to television ads as having had much more of an effect, any more of an effect on uh, the primary outcome as Facebook ads. In fact, the founder of this network that I'm on uh, was reported in the Times over the weekend to have had five times more uh, on television ads that he did on digital ads. And that obviously didn't uh, yield him the nomination either. So I don't think it's a question of channel. I think for me, you know, um, we're we're in a period of time in which we've got to rethink um, our old assumptions about what works and what doesn't work in politics. Um, and you know, it's obvious that money overall, no matter how it was spent, didn't work in this particular or didn't you know sort of determine the outcome of this particular primary. It was a weird primary. Um, 
Uh, so I'm not sure that um, you can conclude from this one that next time there's a competitive primary, the highest spender won't win. Um, but obviously it's the case that in this primary, neither Facebook ads nor TV ads nor a big you know, field presence in Iowa or any of that seem to um, you know, determine the outcome. And I think everybody who's in my line of work needs to think long and hard about what that means for you know, the job that we do and what the value of it is and how we ought to make decisions.